Um, so today, you know, without further ado, we have George, um, and he uh, is doing the topic of we more than just molecules, as you can see, an answer to materialism. So welcome, George. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we're a select but very important group today, so I'm so glad you're able to come out. So I'm not, I've got some, an audience, which is good. Um, now, when we talk about materialism, we often think of you know, people who are interested in material things. But to a philosopher, materialism means something a lot more technical. And it really means that we are just matter. We're just material, and if you like, we're just molecules. And, um, and that's how materialism has come to be thought of with philosophers. Now what I'm going to do, oh by the way I should say that um, there is a tendency for materialism to be more amongst psychologists perhaps than any other group of scientists and uh, not very much with physicists and, and not much with mathematicians and more so biologists. So it does depend on the subject area where materialism seems to raise its head. Anyway what I want to do is I want to summarise, um, getting used to this different machine, just click twice on it, is it? No, click on the left side, sorry. Okay, materialism means four things. And uh, I'm going to provide an answer to all four. And I should mention there's a summary sheet on the table. So if you haven't got one already, it'll summarise some of what I've got here. Uh, I'll read this through quickly. Matter is real and consists of subatomic particles, atoms and molecules leading to determinism. Atoms and molecules obey the laws of classical mechanics, which means everything is predetermined by the laws, and there's no free will. Mind is just a product of our brain, and our brain is just a powerful computer. There is nothing spiritual or supernatural in this world, i.e. no God and no miracles. So those are the four things which, which I see come out of materialism, and I'm going to refute all four. So let's begin um, with... What happens is that, is that today people tend to describe ourselves in various ways. How about this one? A bipedal, featherless, tool-making, naked, ape-like, carnivorous gene machine equipped with a language program computer. That's me and you. And how, they, how do you go down with that? Um, in a sense it's true. In a sense it's true. But the problem is that people tend to look at us, particularly materialists, as we're nothing but this. There's nothing more. So, I've got to get this right again, I've got to go down to the next one. Science described as nothing but. Now I'm going to go very quickly through these to show you how science described us. And the interesting thing is it describes us at different levels. So if we start off with physics, we can describe us as merely a lot of subatomic particles. There are about 200 of them, so I've got a lot of choice. And they operate on certain laws. The chemists will see us as consisting of certain um, elements, certain physical, chemical, magnetic, all sorts of processes going on in our bodies. So that's a sort of an upper level from the, from the lower level. And then the, the um, biochemist might see us from a point of view of genetics. In other words, these molecules that chemistry talks about, there are special kinds which are DNA, and the DNA determine who we are as humans. Then we go up to biochemistry, which can describe us in terms of certain neurotransmitters in our brain, to how we operate and how we function. And we've got glands and hormones, and they determine the type of person that we are, whether we're aggressive, sensitive, even-tempered, or get bored by complicated talks. The biologists can describe us as nothing but an animal, and this sort of behaviour can be studied using the same criteria we use for animals. And one of the things I've learned, and I've been writing this book on apologetics, which is now finished, I'm now trying to get a publisher. One of the things I've read about this is how much we are like animals. It's, be, it's quite amazing. You know, it once said that animals can't learn, plan, or conceptualise. They couldn't count, have no artistic sense. But there is evidence now available for some rudimentary forms of all of these. In fact, some animals are capable almost of ascetic appreciation and abstract thought. And they can have nervous breakdowns, and they can play elaborate games. And some of them show considerable community and family care. Some animals have self-recognition in a mirror. For example, chips, 
bonobos, which are pygmy chimps, orangutans, dolphins and elephants, they can recognise themselves in the mirror, but dogs, monkeys and other primates can't. And some animals, like dogs for example, seem to experience shame and, and lead to change. And we can see that if we have a dog, I haven't got a dog, but I've seen it even in a cat that we used to have. Now what is interesting is at Auckland University, they um, done some experiments with New Caledon Caledonian crows. And what they found is that a, a crow, this particular crow, has got a, a short stick hanging on the end of a string. Now inside the cage, there's a long stick. And with a long stick, you can fish out the food. So the problem for the, the, the crow is to use a little stick to get the big stick to get the food. And they can do that. And there's even one called 007 <laughs> who can do even more things. He can use the small stick to get out three stones from a, a cage-like thing, drop them onto a, a platform, the platform tilts, enables them to get the long stick, then he uses the long stick to get out the food. And how long did he take to do it? He can do it in three minutes. So these crows are very famous for making wooden hook tools and using their beaks to carve wooden sticks and to get, to get food. And no animal species, other animal species, makes this type of tool. And their intelligence rivals that of primates. So if someone calls me a bird brain, I don't feel so bad anymore. <laughs> Anyway, there's another example. It's, uh, uh, this is on, these are on the internet if you want to find them. There's a, there's a talking parrot, it's a species of parrot, and we know they can all mimic. They can answer questions like, you know, um, what colour is this? Red. Um, how many have I got here? Three. And they're able to actually answer correctly. Now, whether that's a bogus one or not, but apparently it is, it is a possibility. Uh, and you look up, I think it's called Alex. The, the, the talking parrot, and you'll see it on a video on the internet. Um, so I wonder what would happen if your cat, dog, bird, or goldfish would be able to say something with human vocal cords. Be interesting, wouldn't it? Uh, in addition to vertebrates, so there's those with backbones, there is a group of invertebrates, and these are the octopuses, the squids, and the cuttlefish. And they really are very they're big brained, and they're very clever, and they're able to to camouflage themselves and they have flexible hunting strategies, so they are very intelligent. Anyway, getting back to where I was before, right. yes, we're back to the an anthropology. We've got to biology, we're similar to animals. Anthropology goes up another level to sort of not just individual animals, but collectively. And anthropology is about customs and taboos, and if we're brought up in a certain culture, we behave a certain way. And so again, this is another way of describing who we are, which is, if you like, a kind of a higher, more complex level. And then we can go and take a big jump into cosmology and say, well, look, we're really accidental specks on a planet, and somehow or other we've evolved from some sort of life. Um, and so each stage, we go up a, a level which is more encompassing and a more level of reality. So we start with, with just particles and work way up to out of space, cosmology. Now the question is, can we go a step further? Is there another level of reality which we can call spirituality and encompass that under theology, which is study, if you like, of spiritual things? I'm not going to answer that question straight away, but I'm leaving it as a question. And I want to um, show you something just to cement this in a bit more. I don't have a scanner, so I'm going to show you this. I want you to have a look at these pictures and tell me what you see. And what's actually happening is that you start at the beginning very, very close to the object. And so what you get is that. Okay. Now some people with great imagination will find something in that. But there is actually nothing in there but just black marks on white. Okay. That's the first one. Now as we move further back, we find that we, we meet another level. And that begins to look like either a cookie monster or maybe it's the letter E. Um, so we begin to think, well, maybe there's something a bit more than this than just the molecular level of black and white, but something which talks about language. When we look again, we find, is it better? We find that it's part of a statement. So we're now, now moving into English language. Yes, that, that, there's the E up on the top there. You've only got part of it. 
Then we go a step further and we find, oh, what do you know? It's part of a letter X. So it's a part of a newspaper. So what, what level is the X talking about? Well, here it is. It's an exit sign. Oh. Cut out a newspaper. But you see, the thing about that is as you go up a level, you increase your level of description and you need a new language to describe what you see. And I'll do one more example. Those of you who attended um, Neil Broom's talk spoke a lot about watches, about finding watches. And I want to have a look at I found it quite interesting looking at watches on the internet. I came up with three kinds, three species of watch. Right? The first one just gives you the, the time, and that's all. It, it's a men's watch. <laughs> we don't need any more than that. Uh, the second one is um, more like our traditional one, and the third one has everything on it. Now, each one of these has a slightly different function. Right? So at some level, they're all made of the same subatomic particles, but each one has a particular function. But there's an overriding function on top of all that, which is telling the time. And so the point I want to get across is it depends on which level you're looking at as to what explanation you have. OK. What I want to look at now is, OK, we're going to look at those four questions now. The first one, matter is real and consists of some atomic particles, atoms and molecules leading to determinism. Now I'm going to get into some science here. OK. Which is hard on a Sunday afternoon, I know. It's supposed to be a day of rest. Um, the first one is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. You may have heard of it. And what it says is that it's not possible to know the exact position and the exact philosophy, exact philosophy, exact philosophy velocity of a particle at the same time. In other words, to find out where a particle is, you actually shine a light on it. Now, of course, when you shine light on it, you're sending photons, which are packets of light energy, and they hit the particle. Okay, you then find out where the particle is, we don't know what its velocity is. And so we find that you can't know both at the same time. This is a fundamental law. But in actual fact, it's actually a little bit more, more complicated than that. In other words, this uncertainty is not just produced by the observer, which is what happens when you observe it, you cause the uncertainty. But it's fundamental. The uncertainty is actually fundamental. And it's because of the nature of subatomic particles. Now, subatomic particles, for example, we know in light, they used to think of light as terms of particles, which are photons, packets of energy, or as a waveform. But in actual fact, subatomic particles are neither. They're neither just simple waves nor their simple particles. They are probability waves. <laughs> wow. Um, now, I want to say a little bit about waves. All right. When you've got waves, you've got a blue wave and a pink wave, boys and girls, if you like. And when you superimpose them, you get the green one. And so when they're slightly out of phase, you get some bigger peaks and some lower peaks. But you always get some places where there's nothing. You notice the green dots on the line? They, the two waves cancel out at that point. Now, if they're completely out of phase, like in the second picture, they completely cancel out. And so what can happen is that light can produce interference patterns. We can get a, a dark, we can get a, a, a bright and a dark, and a bright and a dark. And in fact, when we look at um, an example, they have a, what's called a one slit and two slit experiments. They're very famous experiments where you take a slit, a very narrow slit, and you shine through it a monochromatic, monochromatic light, in this case red light. And what it does is it, you do it in a way so that it sends the, the photons through almost one at a time. So what happens is when you send them through, they actually form a splurge. Because in actual fact, we don't exactly know where they're going to land because of this probability wave. The probability wave says that the particle may end up here, it may end up there, with different probabilities. So what happens, you get a splurge. And when you put it, that, that shows that they're particles, right? And when you put them together, you get the interference pattern. So the second pattern is a pair of slits. This, this next one will perhaps show it even better still. There's, there's a double slit experiment. Now, if you look carefully, you can't see too well. There's just a few light spots up top there where you recorded the arrival of the photon. 
And then you start to get more, and then suddenly you start to get, as more of them pour in, you start to get these interference patterns. And so what they found then is that with light, and we've always known this duality of light, we can have treat light as either particles or as waves. Now what's interesting is they do the same thing with electrons. And their experiments with electrons show you get interference patterns. We'll talk about electron, you know, that's a pretty solid sort of thing. It buzzes around a nucleus and but not their waves. And in fact, subatomic particles generally are not actually things that really exist. They have the potential for existence. They're, they're, if you like, they're just probability waves. Now, where do they exist? That's a good question. Okay. Um, what else do I say about that? That's probably enough. The next one, which I'll go back to, um, particles can be entangled. Oh, I love this one. Einstein calls it, called it spooky action at a distance. Now what happens is that when, um, under certain circumstances, you can produce subatomic particles which are entangled in some way. For example, if you pass a laser beam through a certain substance, you get photons which are tied together, you get a pair. The photon splits into two, and the two are connected, and you have to treat the two like one. You have to use the same quantum states, if you like, as the two together rather than as two individual ones added together. So you've got this, you've got this problem. And what happens is that because of some conservation law, they tend to be related in a strange way. For example, one of the particles might have a clockwise spin, the other one will have an anti-clockwise spin. They sort of cancel out. Now the point is, when you've got these two particles, you don't know which is which. But once you measure one of them, you know the other one's opposite. And it doesn't matter how far apart they are, you'll always get the opposite one. It's almost as though one particle knows what the other particle's doing. And you can have them so far apart, there isn't time for light to get between them. Somehow or other, this is strange, this is why I called it, that's why Einstein called it spooky action at a distance. It's called non-locality. And so what happens is that you can have a pair of particles, and once you've got one, once you've spotted what it is, the other one is opposite. Now, some scientists at Israel have gone even a step further, and they've shown that you can have a pair of particles, they measure one of them, they destroy it, and then look at the other one, and it's the opposite. Even when the first one is destroyed, the second one is still the opposite. Now, I, I'm not going to go any further than that, but all I'm saying is that this throws the whole question of subatomic particles away from just simple materialism. It's just not that anymore. It's something far more complicated. All right, one more thing, relativity theory. Now, relativity theory, is a theory which is developed by um, Einstein. He has the general relativity and special relativity. And um, what, he's, what he stated in his special relativity is that all motion is relative. Well, we sort of know that anyway. And the second one, the speed of light is constant. Now, it doesn't matter how fast you are traveling with respect to me, the speed of light reaching me doesn't change. And this is contrary to ordinary waves. For example, in sound waves, if you're sort of standing here and a train's coming towards you and it makes a tutor, the sound goes up. Because what happens is that the speed of light, the speed of sound is the, is the speed of original speed of sound plus the speed of the train. So the speed of the train sort of squashes, if you like, the wave pattern and it goes up. And when the train moves away, it goes down. But with light, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change. It doesn't matter if, if, the, if the observers, mind you, you've got to be pretty fast. But there's no change. And so this leads to all sorts of things. For example, it turns out that um, when an object is moving very fast relative to me, it gets shorter than what it is at rest. Also, if you're on a spaceship going very, very fast, time slows down. And there's this famous twin paradox of Einstein, which goes like this. You've got a pair of twins. One of them wants a good life, so he stays at home and lives it up. The other one gets into a spaceship and he gallops around the spaceship near the speed of light. He comes home and he's younger. <laughs> so, we're going to get moving, eh? <laughs>
So these are the problems. These are the problems that we face when we think of matter as real. It's not real at all. In fact, where does it exist? Matter is only real when we observe it. It's by observation that we bring it into being. So maybe it exists in the mind of God. Anyway, let's move on. Right, just a brief answer here about that. I'll just summarise. Matter is not real, but has potential to exist. Physics says particles consist of waves and become real only when we observe them. Where does reality exist? And there's a great quote here by a guy called Stapp. Now, his book is really solid reading. He's, he's a, he's a, um, I think he's, he's actually a, a physicist, philosopher, and the book is really very, very interesting because it talks about how, how our brains work as well. There is, in fact, in the quantum universe, no natural place for matter. This conclusion, curiously, is the exact reverse of the circumstance that in the classical physical universe there's no natural place for mind. In other words, okay, there's no place for matter, there's no place for mind and, and, and when, you, when you take the classical viewpoint. So there's the conflict. All right, that's the conclusion. Now I want to look at, um, I'm going to move this along, I'm sorry, I'm not used to this computer. <clears throat> uh, where are we? I think they brought it along a bit. Yeah. Um, what number are we up to? It's number 11. Um, we want number 12. 12, which is um, down. Okay, this is the second question. Molecules obey the laws of classical mechanics, which means everything is predetermined and there's no free will. Now, as we've seen, at the quantum level, there is not only uncertainty, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, but probability. In other words, it's uncertainty in its very nature. It's not uncertainty which we produce by observing. It's uncertainty by its very nature. Now, of course, on a large scale, some of these uncertainties tend to get ironed out. For example, if you look at a gas, and you're getting plenty of that this afternoon, if you're looking at a gas, these particles are buzzing around, right? You can't determine exactly its, the, the, the place and the velocity of any particular particle. But there's lots of them, and they're all hammering away at the sides of the container. They produce a gas. And then we can use classical means to develop a gas law. We don't need quantum theory to do that, because there's an average effect. So what I'm saying is in quantum theory, you can't say a lot about the individual things, but you can use the classical methods to look at the sort of average effect. If you like, the classical mechanics is sort of the big extension of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics looks at the nitty gritty, classical mechanics looks at the bigger picture. So anyway, um, this guy, oh, I want to say something about this free will business too. That, that's, that's a whole other talk, fact free will, not done do that today. Uh, but this is a quote by Haldane, who's an atheist. Back in 1927, so it's pretty ancient, but it's a very famous one. It seems to me immensely unlikely that mind is a mere byproduct of matter. For if my mental processes are determined wholly by the motions of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to believe that my beliefs are true. They may be sound chemically, but it does not make them sound logically. And hence I have no reason for supposing my brain to be composed of atoms. In other words, what he's saying is, if we think our, our, our brains are made of atoms, there's no reason to believe that. Why is it true? We don't know. So we have no reason to believe it. So it's kind of a self-negating philosophical statement. Anyway, that's by the way. Um, what I want to look at now is a conclusion, which is number 13. Um, that's the down one. Which summarises those two. Matter is only real when perceived by a living thing. And this is the real question, which I'm not going to try and answer, but if the physical world exists independently of humans, because we don't know what the physical world really is, probability waves is our latest guess at it, then perhaps it exists only in the mind of God, but its form is currently evolved from our understanding. The world does not appear to be deterministic, as probability is now involved at the fundamental level. And this I find intrigues me, I've thought a lot about this, there appears to be no definite instant when all matter is simultaneously re real. Because it only becomes real when we look at it. 
at the speed of light, time ceases to exist. Okay, that raises some interesting theological questions. <laughs> anyway, that's just a conclusion. What I want to look at now is the next statement, which is, um, there's nothing spiritual. Mind is just a product of our brain, and our brain is just a powerful computer. I've got six refutations, I ref refutations of these. I don't want to go through all of them. There's a couple of really interesting ones. The first one I've already alluded to in that quote from Hawley. <coughs> Why should we believe what we think if our brain is just a lot of molecules? Why should it produce truth? Second one is why can we think abstractly? You know, um, as a mathematician, I've always been intrigued by the way my, my mind works in mathematics. Um, we automatically work in n-dimensional space, mathematical. Um, it's just how we do things. Why are we able to do that if we just concrete? How can something abstract come out of something which is concrete if it's just material? How can we think of things like justice and all these sorts of things? Um, things which we are aware of, but they're not concrete. Where do they come from? How can we think abstractly? The third one, which I find interesting, is that we have certain subjective sensory experiences, like the colour red, taste, for example, of pepper, and smell. Now, the philosophers call this qualia, <coughs> for some unknown reason. Uh, I'm sure it's probably a Latin word with an IA on the end, I don't know. But anyway, the thing about these experiences, we cannot pass them on to other people. They are totally subjective. You know, and I say to you all, have you seen that red colour? You'll probably think of your version of red and your version of red and your version of red. Red is not something, we know it's wavelengths. So if we look at scientists and say red is such and such a wavelength. But in terms of our interpretation of it, then it's totally subjective. And in fact, if you analyse your brain, you only find interacting fields and particles, but not that where, where are these things, these senses that we have? I mean, how can the behaviour of neurons, which are, which are um, things which fire off our brain cell, which fire off in our brain, how is it that they can give rise to things like colour, when the very things that we're made of are colourless, odourless and tasteless? Now, our brain is made of the same thing. So we've got objects which are made of particles. We're made of particles. But somewhere out of all of this, we can produce all these qualia. Then, of course, you've got self-consciousness. Now, self-consciousness, we know that all um, life has some sort of consciousness. I mean, even, and I'm just thinking of some of uh, um, even things like amoebas, which creep around, they have a level of consciousness and they get affected by the surroundings and, and different animals have different perceptions. But we have one more extra thing which we don't know whether animals have or not, that's self-consciousness. We are aware of the fact that we are thinking. We can stand back and say, oh look, there's George Seabrin there trying to explain something. And I can look at myself from an outside point of view and see myself as self. Now where does this self-consciousness come from? Okay, I, I think that one's pretty easy to understand because we all have it. <laughs> I want to get onto another one which is really interesting, which I found, and there's a lot of stuff on the internet about near-death experiences. There's whole books written about them. There's a lot of articles. Um, apparently, <coughs> about four to fifteen percent of the population, depending on the part of the world, because it varies, they have what's called an out-of-body experience, and. As I said, there's a very extensive literature and it's been looked at people who have had cardiac arrest and who have seemed to have died and then been brought back to life. And the experiences that people feel when they or have when they go through these experiences are like the following. Awareness of being dead. In other words, they can see their body lying on a, on a table. Um, positive emotions. Moving through a tunnel. Communication with light. Observation of colours. Observation of celestial landscape. Some sort of life review, your life suddenly is in front of you, indescribable music, experience of over, overwhelming love, and the presence of a border. And also people meet a variety of greeters in their youth experience, such as light beings, angels, and often deceased loved ones. Interesting, isn't it? Not so much present people, but people who've gone on. God's presence, religious figures, and even animals. 
And what's interesting, they are common across all people, irrespective of race or religion or lack of it and age. In other words, they universal these experiences. Now, some people maintain that these experiences are our brain playing tricks on us. And in fact, there's a very large um, program, international program, called AWARE. that has been looking at cases of cardiac arrest ongoing in a number of countries at the time I wrote this. And it's been found that about 20% of such cases had a near-death experience. And a guy called Peter Fenwick, who's a leading authority on these sort of things, he believes that such natural explanations, we're trying to explain in terms of normal things, fall far short of the facts. He had a documentary, I think it was a BBC documentary, entitled Into the Unknown, Strange But True. And he described the state of the brain during a near-death experience as follows. The brain isn't functioning. It's not there. It's destroyed. It's abnormal. But yet it can produce these very clear experiences. An unconscious state is when the brain ceases to function. And when you're unconscious, of course, the memory systems are particularly sensitive to unconsciousness. So you won't remember anything. But yet after one of these experiences, you come out with clear, lucid memories. This is a real puzzle for science. I have not seen any good scientific explanation that can explain that fact. And there are others who have worked in surgery and other areas who have come across the same idea that the mind is more than the brain. I'll give you one example. There's a guy called Dr. Eben Alexander III. What's interesting about him is he's a neurosurgeon. And he had a near that experience. He was interviewed about his experience. And he said he was absolutely certain that it's not all brain chemistry and that consciousness is the thing that exists. And during his near-death experience, he said he experienced wisdom, guidance, and unconditional love. I'm going to say five things then about near-death experience, because I, I think this is a very interesting topic. It's not just about Christians, it's about people generally. Okay, so this gives general confirmation that we're actually more than just our brains. Now, people who are brain-dead can have a near-death experience. And in particular, um, there was one woman um, called, what's her name now? Um, can't find it. Should be here somewhere. Oh, she's named Pam anyway. And she had a near death experience. And when, when, when she was under, she had, they had, what they had to do is they had to stop her heart to do the surgery. She had full cardiac, cardiac arrest. And what happens when this happens, there's a whole lot of things that don't work. For example, there's no uh, um, EEG, which is a measure of heart activity. There's no um, activity in the brainstem. There's no blood going through. The person is actually technically dead. And she was able to explain afterwards everything that was said, what was done, the instruments were used, and all the rest of it. And I will explain to the doctor, this is verified and it's actually on the internet, and I, and I believe it to be true, because there are so many other examples of it. All right. Then we've got people who have known things they couldn't possibly have known unconscious. There are cases, in fact, I think there's a book on this, if I remember rightly, where people have been blind, have had near-death experience, and able to see what's going on. And again, able to say what happened, what was said, who came in, who came out, and all the rest of it during this experience. They may review real events and encounter real people. Often when we dream, we sometimes dream about people we know. I mean, but sometimes we also dream about people we don't know. But the interesting thing is that these are, in these events, they sometimes see real people, particularly those who are deceased, which is interesting, relatives who are deceased. Then, as I said before, these near-death experiences are consistent worldwide, irrespective of religion or non-religion. In other words, they're universal. And then NDEs can actually change lives. And I find that this is a very interesting one. Um, there was a guy who was an atheist, and he actually was in a morgue for three days. <laughs> Not a very exciting place, but anyway, he woke up. He obviously wasn't uh, completely out of it. And he became a pastor as a result of the experience. Um, and I, I saw a video of a guy who, who something happened to, and he, he was completely transformed by this. So these NDEs can radically change life. You suddenly realise that, wow, there's something more to life than just flesh and blood. 
And then this is the real clincher in the end. These experiences can be experienced by bystanders. In other words, there are stories about people who have actually seen the spirit of a person stand up. And they've had experiences. And they, of course, they're, they're, not, they're not near death. They're actually watching what's going on. So, so there you have um, six examples. Excuse where, me, George. Sorry? Could you just elaborate on that a little more? Um, somebody who wasn't having an NDE, they observed someone having an NDE? Well, well they, they had the experience of it, but they weren't, they were physically okay. In other words, they were, if you like, bystanders to somebody else having it. Somebody else having it. Having it, and they saw it. Mm. Now, of course, a lot of these things have to be verified, you know, and there's complicated issues there. But again, there's a lot of material on the internet, and there are a lot of books written about it. And in particular, um, there is one book, which I haven't seen yet, and I'd love to get hold of it. It's written by six authors from different backgrounds, different science backgrounds. And it examines findings from nearly a century of psychical research. And they present empirical studies relate to all kinds of phenomena, including psychosomatic medicine, placebo effects. We all know how to placebo, if you take something which thinks it's going to work, it's going to work. Um, near death and out of body experiences, mystical experiences, physical effects induced by hypnosis, trances, lucid dreaming, that's dreaming when you're sort of awake, but you think, you think you're awake, but you're asleep, um, and existence of creative genius, and to argue for a strongly dualistic theory of mind and brain. Their book depicts the mind as being independent of the brain, but causally interacting with it and surviving death. This is a big book with a lot of stuff in it. Um, and at some stage, I'm, when I've got time, I must get a hold of it and read it, because it, I think it's about 800 pages. It's a really big book. So one of the one of the problems, of course, is is the, is the problem of, of you know if the if the, the the brain is simply produces its own stuff, how do we know it's really true or rational? Would you trust the output from a, com a computer programmed by random forces? You know, if you've got a computer and it sort of acts randomly, um, would you trust the output? And what materialism is said, well, our brains are kind of like that. You know, there's stuff moving around at random, you know, would, would we trust the output? We believe what we think. And in fact, a, a cosmologist by the name of Paul Davies, he's quite a well-known writer, he's written a number of books. He puts it this way, mindless, blundering atoms have conspired to make not just life, not just mind, but understanding. Not only do, are we able to, to see things, but we can understand them. So, he goes on to say, the evolving cosmos has spawned beings who are not merely to watch the show, but to unravel the plot. Our, somehow or other, we have an understanding of what we see. And that's where science comes from. We have the ability to do science. Because, uh, and I'm moving away from my notes here, but we are made in the image of God. We can, in some sense, understand the way God created the world because we have something of God within us and we can see that. I um, now move on to um, my last one, evidence. This is actually my last one, last overhead. Um, the fourth one is there's nothing spiritual or supernatural in this world, I no God and no miracles. Now, one of the problems, of course, when we get into the spiritual things is that we don't actually have any physical evidence of it. In the same way that we can't learn about our watches by looking at subatomic particles. We need another level language. In fact, if you take each one of those, the only way you can, you can learn about certain languages is to see what happens below. For example, if I smash my watch, it doesn't change the way the, the, the particles move and I can't learn anything about the function of a watch. So one of the problems in dealing with spiritual things is that we don't have evidence, actual evidence of a spiritual dimension. We can only find out about it by its products lower down. Okay? Find out by what happens lower down. Now I've just put together five of these. The first one, of course, is a big one, and that's a question I, I, I dealt with last year in my first talk, evidence for God. Evidence that there is a, a spiritual being, a special spiritual being. So if there's a spiritual being, there's a spiritual dimension. 
So we can use all the arguments for the existence of God to come in and say, right, that's evidence of a spiritual dimension. I'm not going there today, we've already been down that path. The second one is an interesting one, demonic influences. Some people say, well look, you know, does Satan really exist? And now there are other spirits or demons who are evil. And of course the, the, the New Testament has over 80 references to demons. And of course, if they're spiritual and not flesh and blood, then we can't prove their existence, only look for evidence of their presence. And there's plenty of evidence, I believe, for demon possession. We, encounter, we can encounter some very strange phenomena, particularly in some societies. It's generally rare, there are some societies who occur more than others. Some would say that these phenomena are a result of mental illness. This could be true in many cases, and some of the things we used to think were demon possession, that we now know they're psychological. For example, um, Tourette syndrome and tics, which is a problem with making involuntary movements. The muscles are, are, are affected. And there's various forms of psychosis, you know, multiple personality disorders and things like that. Um, but it leaves a whole lot of other cases unanswered where people have tried everything, but it's only through exorcism that a change has been made. And of course, these manifestations of demon possession can occur and in several ways. They can occur mentally. You find that people can have changes in personality. They can become more hostile or angry. They can curse a lot, destroy religious objects. All sorts of things can happen. They can have physical changes, like non-blinking, hair or eye colour changes. Um, speaking with the voice of the opposite sex, unusual strength, or slow deterioration in sickness. Now, now I, I support two groups, one called Gospel for Asia and the other Abraham for Christ. And, and they're both involved with reaching out with the, with the indigenous people to their own people to take the gospel. And they provide all sorts of physical means as well. And the stories keep coming in of a pastor will go somewhere and a person is a particular way. It seems to be that they're getting sick, they're getting worse and worse. He comes in, they pray for them, and they are changed. And there are so many experiences of this. What it, what it does show is that, of course, when a person is under the influence of an evil spirit, it can cause deterioration and sickness. Then you've got environmental changes where objects move about and they keep appearing and disappearing. And that's what happens to my glasses and my car keys. <laughs> and then, of course, strange noises. Well, we know about that too. <laughs> what what is, I think makes it difficult in all of this is that when people have brain tumours, their whole personality can change. Because the brain is what the mind works through. It's a communication channel. And when there's something wrong with the brain, it can affect the way a person behaves. You can have a person who is suddenly gets very, very angry. They finally got a brain tumour, they fix it, the anger goes and they're back to where they were before. Now, I know one or two personal cases where this has actually happened. Complete change. Anyway, um, demon possession, we don't want to go too long about that. Uh, faith healing is a lot more interesting. Um, and again, we hear lots of examples of this. In fact, I can remember in Windsor Park, before we became Windsor Park, we were married by Baptist. I can recall one lady who had a miracle healing of hearing. And she showed up on the screen a picture of, of the sort of, what they call audiograph or something, before and after. And you can see the change. I thought, great, here's some actual evidence of something happening. I met a guy who was a surgeon, and he experienced someone watching somebody's leg grow. Now, he was not a guy who'd be easily fooled. You know, those are just a few personal ones. There are other ones I've read about, um, which show that in actual fact, a person can be healed through supernatural healing. The big question, of course, is where does faith come into it? Um, if you look at the 35 miracles of Jesus, and only 10 is the faith of a recipient mentioned and generally not explicitly demanded? And of course, the three people are raised from the dead, well, they didn't have faith, did they? <laughs> Jesus raised them, irrespective of the faith. And sometimes Jesus had problems because of the unbelief of people. He couldn't do the miracles he wanted to do. But it seems to me that this whole question of, of faith healing is more than just about faith. It's, if you like, some sort of divine intervention by God. It's something supernatural. The point I'm trying to make is that this speaks to something bigger than the ordinary material picture. Because one of the problems is that 
physical and psychological healing get confused. Now, I'm a trained counsellor, I've been counselling for 12 years, and so I come across people who have psychological problems. And we've got to be very careful that we label them for what they are. They're not demon possession. They're psychological problems. They're caused by some brain chemistry. They say, for example, depression could be due to not enough serotonin or various explanations are given. So we've got to be very careful. And there's a placebo effect too, which if we think positively about something that's going to work, it works. There's is a huge part of, of us which responds to self-belief. So we've got to be very careful about how we interact this with the whole business of faith healing. Then of course you've got with witch doctors, for example, they put a curse on somebody and someone believes it so much that they die. So there's very, very powerful, the mind is very, very powerful. But once you get beyond all of that, we find that there's evidence in healing of a supernatural realm. And you can build a very strong case. Then, of course, conversion. I see I've been talking to you long, I've got to finish very quickly. Conversion, of course, is an interesting one. They used to think, well, some people used to think that it's, it's, it's basically, um, you know, brainwashing. I uh, once read two books. One was to try and explain that Paul was brainwashed, and then another book which counted it. Uh, very interesting. Conversion's more than that. And those of us who have been converted, which means turning around or being raised from the dead or being born again, different images of what it means, being transformed. Conversion is something which is individual, which indicates something of a spiritual dimension. I like the story of Paul. You know, he was Paul was a, was a famous rabbi, a learned man, and he was out to go to Damascus to get rid of the Christians, and on the way he met Jesus. And Jesus, his life transformed, and he became the greatest mission that, missionary that ever existed. And we read all the things he suffered as a result of it, stoned and shipwrecked and all the rest of it. He prepared to do all of this for the sake of the gospel. That was the depth of his transformation. And then finally we've got religious and mystical experiences. There have been some studies on this. For example, there was um, a couple, Beauregard and O'Leary, they studied um, experiences of Carmelite nuns. And they came to the conclusion that it's more than likely that these mystics are directly experiencing a reality out of themselves. And we all have some kind of mystical experiences that they vary. Sometimes they're brought on by just looking at nature or looking at looking up at the heavens and feeling the presence of God. It could be sometimes in church when we're worshipping. There are so many ways in which we can have these kind of sort of mystical experiences. Some are bigger than others, but they're still outside experiences. They come from outside. Well, I've done my dash. I've talked pretty solidly. Um, the, the, the sheet that's available will list a summary of these things to help, to help you to remind you. So just to summarise, the thing is that each of these four questions, there's definitely evidence against it. And so materialism, I believe, is a no-go. Thank you.